Welcome to Glasgow Museums Resource Centre. My name is Rebecca Quinton and I'm the Curator of European Costume and Textiles. Glasgow Museums Resource Centre is a purpose-built museum store situated in Knits Hill. The first phase, which opened in 2003, was built to house the collection stored previously in the basement of Carbon Grove Museum and Art Gallery, but were moved out when the gallery was refurbished to clear space for the temporary exhibition space, cafe and education suite. The second phase was built a few years later as part of the Riverside Museum project to house collections that had been stored at the old Museum of Transport at Kelvin Hall. Today there are 17 individual stalls known as pods. Each is climate controlled and designed to hold a particular part of the collection. Pod 2, for instance, contains historic wooden cabinets that hold our entomology collection neatly arranged in drawers. Meanwhile, pod 4 is fitted out with racks to hold paintings and other framed works of art. These pods are designed not only to store the various collections safely, but also accessibly, allowing us during normal circumstances to host a range of public tours and viewing sessions, as well as to facilitate research appointments to see specific objects. Here's a group enjoying a tour of the Arms and Armour collection. The Resource Centre also houses the Library and Archive, our Design and Photography Studios and our Conservation Workshops, including textile conservation. Here, Bevan Daly on the left and Maggie Dobby on the right can be seen conserving tapestries to go on display in the refurbished Barrel Collection. The final store to be developed is Pod 17, which is also the furthest away from the entrance and takes up the space between the two doors at the end of the silver wing on the left of this photograph. Pod 17 is in essence Glasgow Museum's wardrobe as it is home to the European Costume and Textile Collection. Over the last few years, this collection has been moved from four different temporary stores across the city, including the Barrel Collection, and is finally together again for the first time in nearly 30 years. But as you can see, it's currently in a bit of a muddle. This large room now stores approximately 20,000 items of European costume and textiles, including all the textiles in the Burrell collection, which have been moved here for safety while the building in Pollock Park is refurbished. The exact size of the collection is not known at present, as numbering and counting in the past has not been consistent, and totals vary depending on how things have been recorded. Is a pair of shoes one pair or two sh shoes? And to make matters worse, our collector's management system that we use to record the information about the collection on often has three records, one for the pair and one for each shoe. To ensure that we were not bringing pests such as clothes moths into this new textile store, every single item has gone through a preventive conservation programme. All objects were wrapped in plastic. The vast majority of items were frozen to kill any possible insects, including their larva that might have been on them. However, delicate objects were placed in quarantine and not unwrapped for at least six months, enabling the life cycle of the moth to be stopped. As you can see though, we've still not managed to unwrap every single box or package yet. So what's in the city's wardrobe and how did it get here? The earliest items are lace and accessories from the 1600s, including this fan, which is one of the first items of costume to be acquired when it was purchased by the City of Glasgow in 1883. It is also the earliest of approximately 150 fans in the collection, the majority of which date to the 19th century. The sticks that support the leaf and the guards that protect the outer edges are made of ivory. The six are shallowly carved with a figure at the top of each. The leaf of the fan is made of vellum, a thin calf 
lamb or kidskin. The front, known as the obverse, is hand-painted with a scene from the Rowan poet Ovid's Metamorphosis, The Judgment of Midas. Including a scene from classical literature on a fan sleeve that showed the user's education and knowledge. Pan, shown centre right with his goat's legs, has, Apollo, has challenged Apollo, the god of music, who was seated on the left, to a music contest. However, when the mountain god Molius proclaimed Apollo the winner, King Midas, a keen follower of Pan, disagreed with the verdict. Apollo, in anger, then turned Midas's ears into Ass's ears as seen here. The reverse of the fan shows a decorative still life arrangement of flowers, including carnations, hyacinths and tulips. As the leaf is only a single layer, it has been mounted à l'anglaise in the English style, with the supporting ends of the guards accessible on the back, but painted over. With the collection finally moved into this new store with its stable environment, we are now rationalising the collection and upgrading the packaging. Slowly replacing the old brown boxes from the 1970s with new acid-free archive quality boxes. The earliest dresses in the collection date from the 1700s and have been repacked into long boxes that allow them to be laid full length. And these are now on the first set of shelves you come to when entering pod 17. These long boxes are not the easiest to carry and we still need to work out a better way of storing them as getting the ones on the top shelves down is not easy. Here's one of the dresses that is packed inside one of those boxes. It is made using a point or mirror repeat silk tissue that was probably woven in Spitalfields, London in about 1720 to 32. If you look closely, it is possible to see faint horizontal stripes in purple, blue and green, where secondary weft threads are woven from selvage to selvage to bring additional colours into the design in imitation of the more expensive brocaded silks. This scan provides an early example of sustainable fashion. The original dress was made in the 1720s or 1730s when the silk was woven and was probably in the form of a robe à la polonaise française, a French gown, also known as a sackback gown. Sometimes if the light is at the right angle, it is still possible to still see the creases left over from the pleats used to decorate that first dress. The dress we see here is a robe à l'anglaise or English gown. The closed bodice at the front and cuffs of plain ruched silk rather than flounces suggest this gown was remade in the late 1770s. It was not unusual to recycle expensive silks during the 18th century. All clothing was handmade with dresses often made using long running stitches that made them relatively easy to unpick and remake in a more contemporary fashion. This one was then used again in the 1870s or 80s for fancy dress. However, these alterations are relatively minor with darts and boning added to the bodice to alter the silhouette to fit the hourglass shape of what was fashionable during the mid Victorian period. Moving right inside the store for this bird's eye view from another corner, you can see some of the frames and bust forms used to display the collection on the top shelves. If anything were to be dropped from height, better for it to be a display furnishing than an object in the collection. Due to the textiles being light sensitive, they are all stored packed away in calico covers, boxes or on rollers, which does mean that objects in the store are not quite as accessible as those on open display in the arms and armour or painting store. So for public tours, we are looking at suitable furniture, such as tables, cabinets, drawers and hoists to help us show items temporarily for a morning or afternoon. The store is also a working space for staff. The tables you see at the front are not only used for the viewing sessions, but also by collections management colleagues and I to inventory and catalogue the collection. Conservation colleagues may also try out new display techniques, which is what is happening at the centre back. This medium sized tapestry that depicts the month of May, a season for couples to go courting, is being used to try out displaying tapestries on sloped boards. Traditionally, medieval and renaissance tapestries are hung for display, 
but over time this can cause a lot of stress to the woven textile. Current conservation practice is to stitch them onto modern support fabrics. However, new technique of lying them on gently sloped boards has started to be used on the continent, and this is what my colleague Helen Hughes is testing out on this tapestry. When not on display or being used for research projects, the tapestries and other large textiles, including carpets and quilts, are stored rolled. This new system was purchased a couple of years ago to store the largest of our flat textiles and is currently housing the tapestry and Islamic carpets from the Burrell collection during the refurbishment project. In due course, we will use it to store the carpets from the Stoddard Templeton collection. At the moment, the largest textile stored on this royal racking is this Renaissance tapestry, measuring 4.6 metres by 8.7 metres, designed by Bernard Van Orley and probably made in Brussels in about 1525 to 32. It was originally woven as a set of nine, showing the seven honours, that's prudence, virtue, faith, honour, fame, justice and nobility all the desired qualities for a wise ruler, between tapestries showing fortune and infamy. This one depicts virtue, the man in the centre wearing a crown of laurels who beats down vice in the form of a fawn. Around him are various allegorical and historical figures, each with their name and attributes. This tapestry is made from a set made for Cardinal Erard de la Marque, who rather than ordering the full set of nine, appears to have only purchased seven. He excluded nobility and infamy. One reason may be that this smaller series places faith, which is also in the Burrell collection, in the centre, which would be particularly apt for a man in holy orders. Other tapestries from this set survive today. Prudence and Justice are both in the Art Institute of Chicago, while Honour is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York. One of the highlights of the European textile collection stored on this royal racking is the royal clothograph, a large inlay patchwork hanging. The inscription along the bottom starts, John Munro, the Paisley artist tailor, born May 16, 1811, author of the royal clothograph work of art. This piece of art took 18 years to complete at odd hours. All round the border is the names of men of learning and genius. Like many other examples of contemporary inlay patchwork quilts, the designs were copied from prints. For example, the sailor on the middle of the bottom row is taken from a print of Thomas Potter Cook as the character William in Black Eyed Susan, a popular play written in 1829. The census for 1851 listed John Munro, aged 40, as the assistant exhibitor of the royal table cover. Doing research on this and other inlay hangings, textile historian Claire Rose discovered a notice in the Belfast newsletter for the 15th of November, 1860, that reads, Mr. J. Monroe, the Paisley artist tailor, who is also a steady advocate of the total abstinence clause, was introduced to the meeting. He exhibited what he designated the Royal Clothograph table cover, which is made of upwards of 4,000 pieces of different coloured cloth stitched together, forming a space eight feet square. He narrated how for 15 years it took him at three hours extra labour each night of five nights in the week to work this table cover, while employed as a tailor each day. He illustrated therefore what patience and perseverance could accomplish and urged upon the young men present to practise those virtues and in order to do so, they should become total abstainers. Over 30 years later, the quilt was sold at a subscription sale on the 8th of March, 1888, to raise money for his widow. We now move on to a smaller set of roller racks into which we are collating sports and leisure wear. This rack of motoring costume was repacked just before lockdown. Indeed, we did not get a chance to finish the labelling. On the rails are hung early 20th century motoring coats. Each is hung on a padded coat hanger that supports the shoulders and is covered in a Tyvek bag to protect it from light, dust and pests. Here is one of the women's motoring coats that was until recently on display at Riverside Museum. 
Early motor cars were open vehicles with no roofs or windscreens to protect motorists and their passengers. So people had to dress accordingly with a layer of outerwear to protect their clothes from the weather and dust thrown up from the roads. In the winter, long fur or leather coats were worn, but in the warmer summer months, women often chose to wear lightweight coats. This one in crisp cream wool trimmed with red velvet on the collar was made by David Kemp and Son. Originally founded as a shawl warehouse in 1832, the store expanded to become a department store. Its premises at 37 Buchanan Street included five floors of showrooms at the front and a factory behind. On the next rack are swimming costumes, which were all repacked into new acid-free boxes several years ago when I was selecting objects for the Bathing Bells exhibition at Scotland Street School Museum. On the first set of shelves are the women's bathing costumes and swimsuits packed chronologically, followed up by swimming caps, then men's swimwear, and finally beachwear. As this is a new store, some shelves are being left underfilled or empty to allow space for new acquisitions over the following decades. The majority of the collection was given to Glasgow museums by generous donors, often the descendants of the original makers or wearers. However, temporary exhibitions sometimes enable us to make strategic new purchases for the collection. Here are two we bought for the Bathing Bells exhibition and show the chronological spread of the bathing and swimwear in the collection. On the left is an Edwardian bathing costume made from red and white striped cotton, consisting of an all-in-one combination of blouse and bloomers over which a short skirt is fastened for modesty. As early bathing costumes were made from non-stretch fabrics such as cotton, they were made loose fitting to allow the wearer to swim in them. Nautical design elements such as the sailor style collar seem to have been particularly popular during this period. On the right is a burkini created by Alzida Zanetti, a Lebanese born Australian based designer that specializes in making sportswear for Muslim women. The bikini was designed originally for the first female Muslim lifeguard working in Sydney to meet both Islamic and swimwear requirements. The top is not only loose fitting, but incorporates a hijud based on the hijab. The design was then modified for retail, of which this is an example. This part of the collection not only includes items worn for swimming, but also beach and bathing wear including a pair of 1920s silk pajamas and 1950s bathing costumes and play suits, such as the pretty red and printed cotton example on the right. There's also a small number of caps of which this yellow and orange example is the most flamboyant. This also demonstrates one of the issues we have storing modern clothing safely, synthetics. These new fibres were not always designed to last. Where possible, we try to preserve them for as long as possible, but they often degrade much quicker than natural fibres, and some may end up having to be disposed of if they cause health and safety issues to staff or risk damaging neighbouring collections as their molecular structure breaks down. The next rack is full of riding and hunting wear. Here are two lovely early examples. The woman's riding habit on the left is made from navy wool pork cloth, the cut of the bodice follows contemporary late 1830s fashions with a large shigo sleeves that were popular during the start of the decade and now pulled into the upper arms with long pinch pleats. The diagonal line of the decorative buttons helps to emphasise the small raised waist. It was worn by Fraser of Dornock who married Louis Hoyes, a plantation owner, a member of the assembly in Grenada one of several items in the collection that is linked to colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade. On the right is a vibrant crimson red hunting coat and waistcoat. Hunting was a popular pastime for the gentry with several Scottish hunt clubs founded in the 1770s. Many clubs chose to have specific uniforms created for their members, often with specific coloured facings on the collar and specially designed hunt buttons. The brass buttons on this coat depict a fox jumping over a thistle and could only be worn by members of the Royal Caledonian Hunt, which was founded in 1777 with the aim of improving the standard of fox hunting in Scotland. This one was worn by George Houston, the only son of Ludwig Houston of Johnston Castle, Renfrewshire, and his wife Anne Sterling. It is one of a number of items donated to the collection by the last laird and his wife. 
Continuing round to the fourth wall in pod 17, we come to double height wall revacking, made possible by a generous grant from Museums Gallery Scotland. A shelving system like this enables us to make efficient use of space in the stores. The roller mechanism lets us fit more racks in the space and the mezzanine level helps to utilise the height of the stall. At the moment, most of the shelves are currently like the ones on the left, filled with old, overpacked boxes arranged in no particular order with inconsistent and often faded labelling, which can make it tricky to find specific items. However, the plan is that on the lower level, we will have women's dresses and separate stored in new boxes in chronological order, all clearly labelled. I've made a start by repacking approximately 300 19th century dresses, some of which you can see on the right. And I hope you agree that this is definitely an improvement. Whereas the old box is used to control two or three dresses, each new box contains only one dress folded neatly with long tissue paper rolls between each fold. Here's one of the dresses beautifully mounted for display in the Century of Style exhibition held in Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum a few years ago. The level of skill shown in the construction and finishing of this dress represents the pinnacle of the dressmaker's skill. Each part of the dress, both internally and externally, has been finished to the highest standard. It is likely that this dress was commissioned or purchased as a wedding dress for the donor's paternal grandmother, Anne Winfield Collins, at her marriage to Sampson Barrendale Smith on the 1st of January 1879 at All Saints Church in Marylebone, London. The bride was born in 1853 in Kingston, Middlesex, the daughter of William Winfield the Millwright and his second wife, Mary Ann Collins. Anna and Sampson had three children and lived in County Durham. It is unusual for us to have English wedding dress in the collection. Whilst the donors lived in Glasgow, today we would normally only acquire items that were made or worn in Glasgow or the surrounding area, and not those that were worn down south. Whilst it is always lovely to get dresses conserved and mounted for displays, one of the many advantages having a public accessible store like Glasgow Museum's Resource Centre is that we are able to hold tours and viewing sessions that allow visitors to see the study the parts you do not usually see when clothing is displayed on the mannequins. Here I've laid Anne's bodice out flat and open to show how it was constructed with the long thin panels each lined with cotton you can also see the boning channels and the padding to fill out the curve between the bust and the shoulders. If we go closer, you can even see the weave and the stitches. This bodice is so particularly well made and finished with all the seams tucked under and stitched so there is no raw edges. Moving down inside the skirt, it's possible to see the elastic tapes that pulled and helped retain the fullness of the skirt to the back and held it in its fish train trail. Then moving down to the hem, we find a pleated and starched frill edged in machine lace around the inside to protect the edge of the silk skirt. This frill could be removed for washing and reattached and helped protect the hem of the skirt from getting dirty as it trailed along the ground. As these were often tacked on, they got caught or snagged on an uneven floor. It was this cheaper part that got damaged or torn. At the moment, I'm working on repacking, enhancing the catalogue of descriptions for the Edwardian dresses in the collection. These range from summer cotton dresses to fancy dinner and evening dresses. This one is a lovely example. The top layer is made of black silk net embroidered with pale yellow chiffon flowers and gilt sequins and bead foliage and bows. Here it is put and put on one of our basic bust forms to help me see the shape and silhouette. We have also started experimenting with how, with more attention to the backdrop and position of the floor sheet, this might work for taking basic infantry photography to go on the online catalogue. 
the mezzanine level of the roller racking has more shelves that currently house a mix of accessories densely packed in boxes. Whilst this worked well at keeping the objects safe for the move, we're hoping to repack the accessories in a more accessible manner that will make it easier for them to be shown as part of future public tours. My colleague Maggie Dobby has been investigating what methods other museums are using and hopes to start prototyping some ideas next year. There are thousands of accessories in the collection that were worn on the head, body, hands and feet, including these delicately embroidered shoes from the 1830s. Women's shoes at this date were made as straights without specific left and right feet, and the soft silk uppers would gradually mould to the feet. Most surviving examples are in plain colours, quite often white, but this pretty pair have been embroidered with sprays of flowers worked in satin and stem stitch. Inside on one of the insoles is the original manufacturer's label for J. McNeil, boot and shoemaker Air. The business was established by John McNeil by 1830, with premises at 4 High Street Air. By 1845, it had expanded to include a leather warehouse, which appears to have become so successful but that by the end of the decade, McNeil was no longer making shoes, but had become a full-time leather merchant, tanner and courier. He became a successful businessman and in 1864 was elected provost of Air. There are also accessories that were carried. As well as fans, there are bags and purses, parasols and umbrellas. The parasols and umbrellas are probably one of the trickiest parts of the collection to pack safely yet accessibly. This one was made by Joseph Wright, who founded the Glasgow Umbrella Manufactory in the 1870s, with premises at 48 Argarth Arcade. His most successful product was the Druco Umbrella, which he was later renamed the Royal Druco after Wright was appointed umbrella maker to Queen Victoria. Other famous patrons included the Princess of Wales, the actress Ellen Terry, and Prime Ministers William Gladstone and Arthur Balfour. Finally to finish, here are two delightful examples from the children's wear collection. Tartan outfits for women were popular throughout Victoria's reign, especially after her purchase of the Balmoral Estate in 1852. Several paintings and photographs show the young princesses in tartan silk dresses and the princes in highland outfits with kilts. On the left is a girl's dress made by J. Godson and Co. Outfitters, 64 Foxford Street, London. The original dress wearer must have liked this dress a lot as it was altered within a couple of years with an additional silk panel inserted at the waist to lengthen the body which is hidden by the silk sash. The little boy's dress on the right was purchased in Paris in 1871 for Charles Louis Spencer, who was born in 1870. He was the youngest son of John Spencer and Rabina Spencer, who lived at 165 Hill Street, Garnet Hill, Glasgow. I do hope you've enjoyed this introduction inside Glasgow's wardrobe, seeing a glimpse of some of the treasures within and hearing about some of the people and places associated with them.